My name's Brigu Bridge. I first got interested in Stonehenge, I suppose, when I was a kid and I visited it with my parents back in the the days when all there was in the way of a visitor centre was a little wooden hut and I think it cost about sixpence to go in and visit. But then I first attended Stonehenge at midsummer in 1970, back before the days of the Free Festival, but nevertheless on Midsummer's Eve there was always a huge crowd of people around Stonehenge who were allowed into the field where the stones actually are, but there was a barbed wire entanglement all around the the stones and military police with dogs on the inside. Well, hang on, because I can remember going in the 60s. In fact, I think I've even got a photograph sitting cross-legged on one of the stones. You know, that didn't seem to be... I mean, maybe this is maybe 67, something like that. I don't think there was anything around the stones. You could just walk straight up to them and sit on them, play around them. Well, by... 1970 there was a barbed wire entanglement all the way around in a circle around the stones and as I say military police with dogs on the the inside I think they may have had some trouble with uh, some of the squaddies going down there on midsummer and getting a bit out of order. So what sort of a gathering was it before the Stonehenge festival started? It was all sorts of people sort of hippie element and people in cloaks sitting there with drums through the night, lots of local people, some squaddies from the the local army camps, a whole collection of all sorts of people, a couple of thousand or so. And the idea was to try and see the sunrise? Yes, and then uh, the so-called druids in their white sheets would come out before dawn and there was a lot of barracking of that, people going well, they've got no rights, they're not genuine druids and so on, why do they get special treatment and everyone else on the on the outside of the, the barbed wire? So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Some, so there were sort of official, official druids on the inside and maybe unofficial ones on the outside? Well, yes, insofar as anyone can be an unofficial druid. I mean, uh, well, because there are lots of different people who call themselves, we are the true orders, aren't they? Well, there are no true orders. They were wiped out by the Romans. So anyone can... I, the Druids who had the the rights given them at Stonehenge at that time in the 60s and 70s had actually been formed, I think, about 1911 or possibly the 19th century, but they they didn't go back all that far. In the following years, I did spend one winter down in... Uh, Cornwall, so I passed back and forth up the 303, hitchhiking back and forth between London and Cornwall quite a few times that winter. I mean, that that route and the, that vision, that wonderful sight that you get of Stonehenge when you come from the, the London direction over the top of the hill and you see Stonehenge spread out before you is part of our national cultural heritage. You know, it's it's part of our visual heritage that, amongst other things, I'm concerned that we're going to lose if we get this Stonehenge tunnel built and the the road diverted. And I think it's actually part of what underlies the the appeal of Stonehenge is that so many people see it in passing and then go, oh, well, we must go and visit that. Well, this know. is what officialdom would say the opposite, probably, wouldn't they? They'd say, well, actually, by, by burying the road, it means that the monument actually is not cluttered with cars, this sort of thing. But it also means that uh, by diverting the road, no one can even see it unless they walk to it or unless they go and pay 20 quid to English Heritage to go and see it. They've got a a monopoly, and a big money-making monopoly, on anyone even seeing it, even from a distance. Because I understand in the 1950s, the cranes came in and they started putting various plinths and bits and pieces of it, putting it back together because they realised that certain parts of it had fallen down, I suppose, the lintels from the very top parts had fallen. And they, so it, a lot of people don't realise that it got a makeover in the 50s and I'm not sure how accurate that was to the original Stonehenge. 
Well, neither am I. I'm not an archaeologist. You'd have to have to talk to archaeologists of whom there are very many distinguished archaeologists who've worked on Stonehenge over the years, and they're all opposed to digging the tunnel. Okay, so what about uh, the, the first three festivals there? Well, there was a camp at Stonehenge in 1974, in the summer of 1974. I wasn't there, but it hit the newspapers. They called themselves the Wallies, the group who camped there. They were there for midsummer in the, in the way that I had been in 1970, but they actually set up camp in the field and refused to move off. And the way the law stood at the time for English Heritage to get an eviction notice on them, they had to actually name them on the court papers. So the people who were camping there decided that they would all be called Wally. So everyone who was summoned to appear in the, the High Court to answer this eviction charge said their name was Wally. I think it was about a 100 so it became known as the Wally Camp. But those people from the the Wally Camp were then at the People's Free Festival in Windsor Great Park that year, which was the third such People's Free Festival in Windsor Great Park, the Queen's Back Garden. And that was something which was set up by anarchist squatters in London and so on as a free festival a kind of reaction to the the commercial pop festivals of the time. And it went on for three years. Uh, The last one was in 74. And in 74, after the Bank Holiday Monday, when the the police came free from policing the, the Reading Festival, which was going on at the same time, the police moved in on it and violently shifted everybody off Windsor Great Park. I was there running a free food kitchen at the free festival at the time, so uh, I was one of the thousands of people who were moved off Windsor Great Park then, and we actually moved the remnants of the free food kitchen up to Stonehenge, there was a, a kind of refugee camp of people who'd been moved off Windsor Great Park, which then convened at Stonehenge on the edges of the byway that uh, made a triangle, still does, of the field that's actually owned by English Heritage. And we were there from about the 1st of September through till about the end of September when uh, gales drove people off and uh, some of them set up a a squat in Amesbury for a while. That was actually where I met the mother of my two sons, but that's another story. But I suppose that helped give me an emotional tie to Stonehenge as well. So the idea came about that uh, seeing as we weren't being allowed to have a free festival at Windsor Great Park anymore it would be good to have a free festival at Stonehenge and so the first Stonehenge free festival happened in 1975 and I was there running a a free food kitchen again and it carried on throughout the 70s and into the 80s. One problem always must be when you get large numbers of people together to do something like that problems with illegal activity going on, whatever, drug dealing, this sort of thing. Uh, Maybe violence where there's no police around. I mean, this is one of the big fears. And maybe it's more of a fear than a reality that, you know, when large numbers of people get together, you get a kind of lawlessness. Well, I think what happened with Stonehenge and Stonehenge Free Festival was that it did become too lawless if you like, due to the initial attitude of the the police, which was that they, they stood back. And throughout the 70s, it was a fairly low-key and, and nice event. But because it became known as a place where there was no policing on site, that did allow certain elements to come in. And 
it did get a bit out of hand towards the end. But, you know, back in the 70s, no one really cared about cannabis. Nobody still does. And it was only in the 80s that we started to get a, a big rise in the, the amount of hard drugs in society in general. But um, that's heroin, cocaine, that sort of thing. That sort of thing. That manifested at Stonehenge because it was a kind of lawless environment. But it was manifesting in all the inner cities in, in Britain at the same time. It wasn't peculiar to Stonehenge. And those of us who'd been prominent, if you like, in being part of the Stonehenge Free Festival, and I don't say organising because no one organised the Stonehenge Free Festival. It was all self-organised. Everyone organised themselves and everyone did it on the the principle of the the festival is what you bring to it. I mean, drugs are one problem and, you know, it might be that it would uh, only affect the person that's taking them if they're having a bad time on the drugs or whatever. But, I mean, how, how does a large bunch of people like that at a free festival deal with violence that's another thing if people start kicking off against each other well generally by um pressure of a, a lot of people gathering around and saying no no calm down calm down but there there was trouble at stonehenge from time to time you know some biker gangs in particular were caused a bit of trouble and actually by the early 80s 83 84 it had got to be a place that you, you didn't necessarily want to take your kids to. What about the positive side, though? I mean, the music, you know, what kind of things, cultural things were going on at the festival? Well, the music was uh, very good, a lot of it. Hawkwind always played and uh, the Here and Now band and so on. There were sort of anarchistic bands that liked to play for free at the free festival. It was a very positive, kind of creative kind of thing. that it, You created the festival by what you brought to it. People wanted to have a, have a good time, have a festival, have the kind of creative things that we see now in, in Glastonbury Festival. If you look at Glastonbury Festival and all the, the creative stuff that goes on there in terms of all sorts of visual arts and theater, street theatre and all that sort of thing... It, it was all happening back in Stonehenge in the the seventies and early eighties. I suppose the idea is this kind of open mic as well, where almost anyone can turn up, knowing that they're going to get on a stage and do their thing. Absolutely, uh, and it made space for up and coming musicians and and performers to find an audience. I mean, in the 80s, of course, you've got the Glastonbury Festival and Stonehenge going on in parallel. Well, not quite in parallel, but what was the relationship between the two? Not quite in parallel, and Glastonbury was for people who could afford the tickets, so it was kind of a little bit more middle class than Stonehenge, and Stonehenge was for the people who needed to go to something free, and, and particularly in the 80s with the vast increase in unemployment that went on when Margaret Thatcher got in and uh, cut all the, the subsidies that were keeping jobs together during the, the late 70s. And unemployment rocketed, went from 1 million to 3 million in a couple of years when Margaret Thatcher got in and there were riots in the cities and, and so on. There were a lot more poor people who decided to come to Stonehenge. And it coincidentally... One of those years, I don't remember if it was 80 or 81, but one of those years, the, the summer solstice actually coincided with a weekend. So vastly more people came and it went from being a festival of six or 7,000 people as it had been through, as it had gradually built up to through the, the 70s to the, to the end of the 70s it suddenly went in one year from that to being 20,000 plus. At that point, it got a little bit more dodgy. I mean, was there ever any um, understanding by Wiltshire Police that maybe they should have a kind of 
fairly low key presence so that they weren't there to maybe to arrest somebody for cannabis but if there was anything more serious going on that they might because that's what the way that it seems to work now at places like Glastonbury and other festivals nowadays is the police are there but it's a very low key so that wasn't really happening in the 80s is that what you're saying well what happened at Stonehenge was that the the police were there on the outside of the festival, but didn't, unless they were coming in undercover, and we've learnt a lot in the past few years about undercover policing and, and what was going on in those days, um, but unless they were doing it undercover, they weren't actually coming in on the, the festival site, that there was a, a police station down in the, the car park of the, the monument itself. So they had a sort of arm's length attitude towards it and they were actually afraid that if they came on site then people in a large mass would confront them and drive them off site again. So, so what have you learned about undercover police in those days? I mean we know quite a lot more about more recent stuff I suppose from the noughties but what about in those days? Do you know what they were up to? Well we know that the the undercover policing stuff started in the in the late sixties. We still have a lot to find out, and there's the Pitchford inquiry going on at the moment, which is supposed to be finding out what went on. But we know that between the late sixties and the early two thousands, there were actually hundreds of undercover police employed, and we only know the identities of. Uh, about 24 of them, I think, at the moment. So there's an awful lot still to be found out. But certainly during the, the Thatcher years, during the, the 80s, there were an awful lot of people who were regarded by the government as being the enemy within. That was actually a phrase that Margaret Thatcher used. And that covered the peace movement, the CND and the the peace camps and Greenham Common and so on. It covered the trade unions and to an extent it covered uh, hippie anarchists as well. There was some overlap. Well, you're talking about a, 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 an increase in um, trouble uh, during the 80s at Stonehenge. Do you think any of that's put, put down to a by agent provocateurs? Because we certainly know more recently that there have been police, you know, Big, big marches in London, things like that, have had adjunct provocateurs attached? It could have been. Um, one really has no evidence at the moment to to point a finger and say that incident was caused by an adjunct provocateur. Um, but it's not beyond the bounds of possibility at all. I actually tried to get um, recognised as a an accredited participant in the, the Pitchford Inquiry because of my involvement in the, the Big Green Gathering, of which I was a, a director from the, the early 90s through till uh, 2009, um, because that was closed down by the police in 2009. And shortly afterwards, we found out that uh, one of the people who was very prominent in running our main on-site bar which was raising funds for climate change actions um, was Mark Kennedy one of these undercover police um, he was actually the the transport manager of our, our main bar that was called the Last Chance Saloon and he was passing information to ACPO the Association of Chief Police Officers and the impetus to close down the the big green gathering, although it had been running for 16 years and was fully licensed and compliant with its license conditions and so on, uh, that came from the Chief Constable of Avon and Somerset at the time. Um, but so far, we haven't been successful in getting accreditation to the um, Pitchford Inquiry, so that hasn't gone any further and there's a lot there that we'd like to find out the the truth of what information was actually being passed and and how far that was what contributed to uh, what happened to the to the big ring gathering 
So I've tried to be involved on that level, but so far without success. I mean, with things like the uh, Stonehenge Festival, the Green Gathering, what threat do you think they represent? Why are people, Why do the establishment are afraid of these things? Why? Well, I suppose the establishment is always a bit afraid of people who are out of control, not following the rules, not fitting in with the the way society would like them to be. Um, our rulers feel uncomfortable and, and feel threatened quite often out of all proportion to how much threat people do pose. Going back to the relationship between um, Stonehenge and Glastonbury, one's before the other, I think, isn't it? Well, the Stonehenge Festival, by the um, the 80s, it had grown to be something that went on for the whole of the month of June because in order to invade the the surrounding fields that were farmed and owned by the National Trust and rented out to a local farmer, people started arriving earlier and earlier to be there before the gates were padlocked and people were there to stop them. And so the start of it gradually crept earlier and earlier until it was running for the, the whole of June. Glastonbury Festival decided to have its weekend on the weekend immediately after the the solstice. So that was the you know around the twenty second of June or thereabouts. So I mean there would be quite a lot of people who would turn up at Stonehenge and then go on to Glastonbury or go down to Glastonbury just for that weekend and then come back to Stonehenge. But Stonehenge tended to mop up the people who couldn't afford to go to Glastonbury. I mean, some of the people who went to Stonehenge were actually then doing things at Glastonbury and actually taking part of the show to Glastonbury and had tickets for for that reason. But it was only after Stonehenge was closed down, the, the free festival was closed down, that Michael Evis started having much more trouble with uh, people trying to get into Glastonbury without tickets and so on, and eventually had to build the mega fences and security that they have now. I mean, you know, a cynical person would look at it and say, well, in a way, Glastonbury was providing an opportunity for people to do a Stonehenge, but with a kind of paywall around it. And I know... I don't know what year it first started, but um, the Glastonbury Festival was Arabella Churchill's uh, brainchild. She was certainly involved with it, and and she was uh, really the person behind the theatre field at Glastonbury. That was that was her part of the. There's a bridge now on the site there that's named after her, Arabella's Bridge, and she was a a big part of the organisation of Glastonbury Festival and of making it more than just a pop festival, making it a general arts festival that included theatre and circus and all sorts of other things. That seems to jar a little bit, what with Winston, you know, the... uh, okay, so there's a whole bunch of people that think Winston Churchill's fantastic, you know, wonderful chap that won the Second World War for us all. But then there's another side to him, which is him after the Second World War being kept off the BBC because he kept talking about wanting to nuke Moscow and this kind of thing. So he's a very controversial character, certainly seemed to be doing all sorts of dodgy deals with Roosevelt and Stalin, stitching up Poland, all these kinds of things. Saw himself as a sort of um, globalist, I suppose, trying to run things and use the Second World War to his advantage. But what does Arabella Churchill, his daughter, then creating this wonderful festival doesn't seem to fit somehow. Well, I didn't personally know Arabella, so there's not all that much I can say. But if we're talking about Churchill, there's another side to him before the Second World War as well, because he was a government minister through the 1920s. He was uh, Home Secretary during the general strike in 1926. He sent the troops into the, the coal mines. He's not remembered in, I know, in South Wales, he's not remembered in the same 
sycophantic way as he is where he's remembered only for being the leader in the the second world war there's still a lot of bitterness amongst people whose memories go right back to the the general strike um and he was quite ruthless then in helping to put down the the general strike but by the same token he was also an old drunk who liked a good time so you know i can't claim to be an expert on him I was just thinking, I was reading recently that uh, Adolf Hitler had said that when he took over Britain, he wanted Blenheim Palace, the Churchill family home, to be his headquarters when he wanted to move in, <laughs> which does may, may, maybe imply that he felt that he was some part of some sort of aristocracy. But anyway, we're getting off the topic, really. And I suppose during the spring and summer and autumn, was there a sort of a series of regular, right, we're going here, now we're going here, we're going... I mean, was there... Did it set, did a kind of pattern develop of where the convoy went during the year? A bit of one. I mean, the the centre point was always Stonehenge. There would sometimes be a festival around the end of May before Stonehenge, probably around the May bank holiday weekend. Someone had set one up somewhere. Um, so people would then go from there to Stonehenge, and then from Stonehenge would be the the biggest convoy of the summer because that would be where the largest number of people had gathered. They developed a bit of a pattern. I mean, for a few years, the convoy from Stonehenge went off to a, a place near Yate, near Bristol, Ingleston Common, and. Uh, put on a little festival there. There was one year, um, it must have been 78, it went to Glastonbury area. In fact, in 77, there was a a free festival that occurred in Glastonbury area on the 7th of the 7th, 77. And the following year, people from Stonehenge said, well, uh, that was nice being re- down Glastonbury Way last year. We'll go down that way again. And went from Stonehenge down to Glastonbury area, and the police actually diverted them onto Michael Evis's land at Worthy Farm. Wouldn't let them go anywhere else. And Michael said, uh, oh, well, this is all a bit of a shock, couldn't you come back next year because we're planning to restart the Glastonbury Festival next year? He actually ended up with a a free festival on his land the year before he was planning for it because the police had shepherded everybody onto his land in 78. And I think probably 79 and 80 and 81 were Ingleston Common. But there were a number of sites around that people went to and it did vary from year to year so sometimes the police directing you sometimes you're going where you want and other times the police just coming storming in and saying get out of here well the police had to operate within the law to an extent at any rate and they had to do what they could actually cope with because there aren't infinite numbers of police available at the drop of the hat to deal with a a lot of people even if they're driving dodgy vehicles or have grounds of that they could be stopped for suspicion how do you stop a hundred vehicles without causing chaos and blocking all the roads and where do you put them and so on you know people have to they'd have to plan to do something like that you can't just stop them with two police cars in the middle of the night so, for example, when this convoy went in 78 down to Glastonbury area, they thought, oh, well, we know what we'll do. We'll send them down to Michael Evis, get them off the road, and decide what we do with them from there. So that was the, the sort of thing that happened. How do 100 different drivers of 100 different vehicles uh, reach a decision about where they're going? They follow the one in front. Did the convoy literally have a vehicle at the front and the person driving that vehicle made a decision about where the convoy's going? 
I think that's generally how it happened, yes. They they might know where they're making for in the first place. They probably would, and then that may have been something that was discussed among quite a lot of people beforehand. But, uh, yeah, one at the front would be leading the way. That's inevitable. You've been talking quite a lot about Stonehenge. To what extent was there any kind of serious pagan interest in the whole sort of what Stonehenge represents religiously or was it just a did it just happen to be a, a focus for attention or both people felt and I think were right to feel that Stonehenge is part of our heritage and belongs to all of us you know in fact it was left to the nation because it was felt that it was part of our heritage that belonged to all of us there's some interest in the, you know, having the, the mock druids who came and did their thing at Midsummer focused attention on it being a, some kind of a temple, some kind of a religious site. And in a post-religious and scientific age, a lot of people look for some kind of spiritual or deeper significance to their lives and actually insofar as Stonehenge is a kind of observatory that marks the the passing of the the seasons and the um the solstices and the the phases of the moon and so on and and we do understand that it does that and it is some kind of celestial calendar in the arrangement of the the stones there's a kind of pagan significance in marking that and being in some way connected to the passage of the seasons the the position of the earth in the the heavens and the it's the passage of the the earth around the sun that actually provides us with all the energy on earth and keeps us as as human beings in and all creation on earth as a a living entity it, you know it powers the the ecosphere if you like so there's a kind of meeting between a a spiritual need and a, a scientific reality that you know it fits with a kind of modern paganism where one can feel there's something holy about the position of this blue planet in space that happens to support life because of where it is and the way that it goes around the sun. So, to a greater or lesser extent, people came to identify with that kind of perspective that took in the need for a spiritual dimension in their lives and the reality of nature and the cosmos. Throughout history, the downtrodden people who've been repressed in one way or another by the, the ruling classes have from time to time found their own way, successful or unsuccessful, of fighting back in some way. And the history that has taken us from feudalism to some kind of democracy is a, a continuum in which the power of the ruling classes has been gradually nudged back slightly by uh, people's rebellions from below. And it's it's happened all over this country and in many other countries as well. Can you tell us when it was that uh, Stonehenge was stopped and how it happened, what happened? Well, the last Stonehenge festival that happened was in 1984. And that one was too out of control for the the authorities to ignore anymore, I think. There was a police porter cabin in the, the car park of the, the monument 
that actually got tipped over by people from the festival. At that point, I think the, the police and the, the authorities said, no, something has to be done. And then in 1985, well, during the winter of uh, 84, 85, I had been part of a, a peace camp at Molesworth in Cambridgeshire, which was scheduled to become the second cruise missile base in Britain after Greenham Common. Greenham Common was already up and running. It was a, a huge escalation in the, the nuclear arms race. It meant that there would be cruise missiles deployed in Britain that could be fired off the back of lorries. The lorries were going to be based at Greenham Common, just off the M4, and at Molesworth in Cambridge, just off the A1, the plan was that when a nuclear war was going to break out, those missiles would disperse so that they couldn't be targeted by the Russians because they wouldn't know where they were. And they were intermediate-range missiles so that they would arrive very quickly in Russia and Eastern Europe and they were supposed to be very, very accurate so that they would be able to take out the the Russian uh, missiles before they could be fired. They were really uh, a first strike we weapon, or they were certainly seen as such by the, the Russians, and that's what added so much to the the tensions at the time of the, the nuclear arms race. And they were very, very much opposed by people in... Britain by the peace movement and uh, so there was the women's peace camp set up at Greenham Common in 1981 and a number of other peace camps set up at other bases around the, the country including one at uh, Molesworth and in 1984 there was a, a green gathering took place at Molesworth that actually invaded the base. Molesworth at that time was a kind of disused Second World War air base. It had a compound in the middle of it, which at that time was used by the US forces in Britain for storing redundant equipment. And every year they would have an auction and auction off a load of army surplus stuff there. But the rest of the site, which was uh, a few square miles of Cambridgeshire, was actually deserted and not used and had no outside fence. So we decided we would have a we didn't have another site for a a green gathering that year, and decided that we would have a a green gathering there at uh, Molesworth, and so. That was a, a kind of festival that invaded the, the MOD land there. And after the festival, various of us stayed on over the winter and became the Molesworth Rainbow Village. And we were living in tents and trucks and teepees and so on through the winter. And the following February, 6th of February, on a full moon, we were evicted by Michael Hesseltine, who was Minister of Defence at the time, uh, and three and a half thousand troops and police. It was the biggest job by the um, Royal Engineers since the crossing of the Rhine in 1944, so they said. Um, and so they evicted the, the peace camp from the MOD land, and put up a, a big barbed wire fence all the way around it in one night. I think it was a seven-mile perimeter that they fenced in one night. So I was there. I was part of that. I was thrown off uh, Molesworth by Mr. Hesseltine, who turned up at, in the morning after uh, it had all gone on through the the night, came down by helicopter wearing a, a flak jacket, and was pictured for the the newspapers and so on, 
and it was front page in all the all the papers and so and everything. Those of us who were thrown off on that night became a, a kind of flying squad, a, an irritant around the Molesworth area for uh, two or three months afterwards, through till Easter, which had been scheduled as a big national CND demonstration at Molesworth. So we were buzzing around and, and camping where we could. Um, one or two other ex-air bases and uh, reservoir and one or two laybys and so on around the area. We were buzzing around through until Easter. And it was after that when I and a few other remnants of that camp were actually uh, parked up in Milton Keynes through CND and Green CND, which was a specialist section of CND for green people. We were approached by someone from the National Trust, from the National Council of the National Trust, and asked to go to a meeting with National Trust and English Heritage about Stonehenge because English Heritage and National Trust were taking out high court orders to stop the Stonehenge festivals. They figured that I had some kind of connection with the Stonehenge people and so I got invited to this meeting at the English Heritage Headquarters, I think it was, or either that or National Trust, but there was uh, Angus Sterling from uh, English Heritage, Dame Jennifer Jenkins from National Trust, and various other functionaries. And they were saying, unfortunately, we can't do anything about Stonehenge because it's all been taken out of our hands by the police. They were feeling powerless and a bit nervous about what was going to happen at Stonehenge. And sure enough, when people went for Stonehenge on June the 1st, there were vast amounts of uh, police waiting for them. This is 1985. And uh, they got diverted into a, a field by a police roadblock and uh, then all the, their vehicles were smashed up and 500 people arrested. They had uh, people in police cells all over the, the south of England. I hadn't actually gone on that expedition because there were a few of us who could see what was going to happen and we were sitting in Savanac Forest saying, no, we've got a, a good site here for a few days in Savanac Forest, let's just stay here and let them waste all their, all their money on mounting a big operation on the wrong day. Um, but fortunately, there were people like the Earl of Cardigan who went along and, and various journalists who uh, went along and saw what happened. And there were TV cameras and so on in there who saw what happened with the, the police smashing everybody's vehicles up and behaving very roughly with the, the people who they hauled off. And it was known as the Battle of the Beanfield. That was how they stopped Stonehenge first of all happening. Put this in its political context, you've also got uh, whopping, the minor strike, this kind of thing going on. Almost every summer something was happening in the Thatcher years to take out one of these big social movements. Yes, well, the minor strike had been 84, 85, so that finished in the, the spring of 85. By that time, there were all these paramilitary police squads that had been working in the in the coal fields. And it was just another example of that, that they drafted in paramilitary police squads from all over the country to deal with Stonehenge that summer. The idea of people sort of travelling en masse uh, in vehicles, were you doing that as well? Not so much myself, but I, I know what was going on. It actually started from... The the squats, I was in the early 70s, I was in, uh, or the mid-70s, uh, I was living in a squatters community in West London, in Twickenham, because in those days, you know, it was 
more difficult to get rid of squatters. They they made it easier and easier. But there were lots of places where there were vast areas that had been cleared out of people and held for redevelopment, uh, stood empty for years, and people had no nowhere to live, squatted them. And this community that I was in, in uh, Twickenham, was one of those. The developers, who were Bovis Construction, gradually managed to get people out of one house after another, and as soon as they did, they would demolish the house. So it was like a mouth that had lost half its teeth, the street in the end. You know, it was uh, patches of waste ground in be- in between these houses. People realised that actually they could buy up old buses or, the, or old trucks and stay within the community living in a, a bus or a truck in between the houses. And that went on for a while, and those same people would take their buses and trucks off to festivals in the summer because if you're living in a truck, it's easy to take you home with you. And people started going from one festival to another. All the people in trucks would go in a group, because that meant that they had mutual aid. Someone broke down, someone else would stop and help them, and so on. And some people who had dodgy vehicles without a, an MOT on them or so on would be perhaps less likely to be stopped if they were in a group. That whole thing developed into... The convoy, what was known as the convoy. It only became known as the peace convoy after it went from Stonehenge one year to Greenham Common. I think that would have been 1982. The women had already set up the peace camp at Greenham Common. At the end of Stonehenge Festival, there was always the question, well, where are we going next, folks? And someone suggested, well we should go and support the women at Greenham Common. So rather than just being a convoy of people looking for another festival, it went with a bit of a purpose to it. Somebody produced a a stencil that said Peace Convoy, and people stenciled Peace Convoy onto the side of their trucks and went off to Greenham Common, knocked down the fence with sledgehammers, caused a bit of a ruckus. That didn't receive much publicity, but... Thereafter, wherever those trucks went, all sorts of, I think, probably grossly overblown stories started appearing about this uh, dreadful peace convoy that had been rampaging around the country and that had been deliberately spilling oil out of the back of the, the vehicles to make following police cars skid and crash and... All sorts of weird stories like that appeared in the, the tabloids. Any truth to that? Not so far as I'm aware, no. It just sounds like good stories for blackening people's names. And the name was blackened as the Peace Convoy. I can imagine, you you know, you could actually take up quite a lot of space on the road with a convoy like that. You could, you know, 150 vehicles, something like that. Trucks, coaches, one or two double-decker buses... You know, vehicles that were big enough to convert into a living space. So anything from a tranny van upwards to a double-decker bus. But you can imagine um, something as heavy as a lorry or a, a bus. It's not going to fare very well on a field. No, but uh, if you've got enough of them, then you've got uh, enough to tow people off. You know, So some people started getting... Specialist vehicles, ex-army vehicles and so on, that were capable of towing other vehicles off fields if need be. What about running repairs? Well, amongst those people who did that, people who were into trucks, a lot of them were mechanics of one sort or another and got better and better at it and uh, would do these things collectively together. So it was it was possible to do it. I mean, the most fantastic patching up that happened was after the the bean field in uh, 1985, because there was a group of people who'd stayed behind in Savanac Forest and hadn't gone on the run to Stonehenge on June the first. That meant that when the the 500 people who'd been arrested 
were then bailed out because they couldn't keep them forever in uh, police custody. The police had to release all these vehicles that they'd impounded that had been smashed up one way or another. People then brought them back to the camp at Savanac Forest and in the following week did an awful lot of patching up so that they could actually go on the road again. And when there was a high court order for people to get out to Savanac Forest, you know, all this had been on the, the news and had caused a, a great kerfuffle and the, and the police weren't going to do it again. So there was actually a, a negotiation that went on with the the police to allow people to drive out of Savanac Forest with these dodgy vehicles and, and go somewhere else. These vehicles that had been smashed up with the, the intention of making them undrivable and unserviceable, most of them had been patched up in some way that they could get back on the road, even though some of them didn't have windscreens and didn't have uh, windows and so on. It's interesting uh, that uh, you know, you've got someone from the aristocracy that almost like sided with the convoy rather than the establishment. I mean, how did that happen? Who was this character? Well, Lord Cardigan was actually the the landowner of the land at Savanac Forest where people had gathered together the night before going for Stonehenge. He was aware of what what had been happening. You know, there, there was this big encampment of people on his land who were going to go for Stonehenge. And he actually rode along the following day on a motorbike, went down to see what was going on, and saw all the vehicles being smashed up by the police in the in the field, in the so-called bean field. He was outraged by it and very outspoken about it. And so he was interviewed and on the television news and so on and was very supportive because although he didn't necessarily want all these people on his land, he certainly didn't want to see British people being beaten up by the police in that way. A lot of the people who'd been part of that convoy left the country. Some went to Ireland, some went to Spain. A lot of them just went underground, and, and certainly from that point onwards, to get any kind of a festival site became really, really difficult. And there were no more green gatherings for a while, and there were no more free festivals for a while. And the festival scene downsized itself. It went into little camps for a couple of hundred people, which was sufficiently under the radar. You could get away with it and rent a farmer's field for a a couple of weeks and have a, a camp and so long as there's maybe 300 three or 400 people at the most then you could get away with that and be under the radar and not and not cause a, a big kerfuffle that went on through the rest of the Thatcher years into the 1990s at the same time well Glastonbury was the only festival that really continued through that period and then how I came to be organising the Big Green Gathering was in the early 90s, 93, I was organising the, the teepee field in the Glastonbury Festival. I was also running a, a small camp in the summer, which was called the Green Gathering and Creative Crafts Camp, where we had sort of green political discussions on the one hand and, and hands-on craft sessions in the other kind of balance of head and hands, just as a small camp, one of these camps of three or four hundred people. And I went around the green fields at Glastonbury Festival, seeing a lot of my old mates who had been part of the, the early green gatherings in the early 80s, saying, isn't it about time that we had our own big green gatherings again? Lots of people agreed, so we, we set up a meeting out of which we set up a, a company to run the Big Green Gathering. It was done on a, 
a mutual basis. It was a quasi-cooperative in which people could be shareholders but only have one share each. So it was a, a democratic kind of setup. And so we ran big green gatherings from 1994 all the way through till 2009. And when we set it up, we thought, oh, well, it will probably last two or three years and then go broke because many people had tried to run festivals and that was usually what happened. They spent one or two years establishing themselves and in the third or fourth year they would uh, blow it and go broke. But fortunately with the, the big green gathering and I think because it had this democratic setup and people felt that they had ownership of it, people owned the company, people owned the event and worked cooperatively to make sure it happened. We were able to keep going all the way through the uh, the 1990s. We had a, a very interesting time in Wiltshire from 95 to 2000, and we were actually working with a chief superintendent in Wiltshire Police in Salisbury, who had been, at the time of the Beanfield in 85, Fred Pritchard was his name. He'd been uh, in charge of Amesbury Police Station in 1985 when the, the Beanfield happened. He'd had to process 500 hippies through his police station in a night. And from that point on, Wiltshire Police were then spending over a million pound a year every summer on making sure that Stonehenge Free Festival didn't happen again and keeping any vestiges of hippies and convoys and festivals out of Wiltshire. It was a festival-free zone. And they were spending one or two million quid a year on it. And Fred was actually not all that happy with it. And when the Big Green Gathering in its second year, having been in its first year, on a, a site at Watchfield in Oxfordshire, which was, that's another story. We found a, a site in uh, Wiltshire. We were on Fred Pritchard's patch and he came to us and he clearly wanted to show there was a power struggle going on within Wiltshire Police between the existing chief constable who'd kept this spending on, the, on Festival Free Wiltshire going for over a decade and those who would like to have brought that to a close somehow or other. So we managed to have an arrangement with Fred Pritchard where we, the Big Green Gathering, were actually the self-organised hippie festival that showed a festival could be properly organised, could take part in Wiltshire without turning into a totally lawless other Stonehenge. So he took the the gamble of allowing it to take place and we worked with Wiltshire police, not always in total harmony with them, but nevertheless talking with them all the way through, being in, in contact with them and showing that we could have a festival which wouldn't be chaos, which wouldn't be taken over by uh, lawless unruly elements and could actually run itself properly and we did that near Longbridge Deverell from 95 to 2000. One year we had a the police set up a, a searching point to search people for drugs and there were I think about three people that year actually got strip searched by the police and then we had a an on-site naked protest against the the police, and about a hundred naked people swarmed around the the police van. The police all hid in their van while this was going on, and then radioed for reinforcements. And uh, it was all jolly good fun. And they didn't do the strip searching the following year. So it, I mean, we had little ups and downs like that with. Wiltshire Police, but on the whole, we worked together and made sure that we had a an event which ran as well as could be expected. I mean, have you got any advice for anyone 
thinking of or already organising festivals around this area of how you get a good relationship going with the police? Well, we did all right in Wiltshire. And then we moved from there into Somerset. The Big Green Gathering shifted site to um, outside of Cheddar. We were there until 2009. And we found it more difficult there. The police upped the pressure on us every year by their demands in terms of... uh, licensing conditions the amount that we were having to pay every year to pay for a police presence to pay for the policing of the the event and to pay for private security it was the police who determined in the course of the licensing process how much policing and how much private security we were going to have to have and how much we were going to have to pay for it and the amount Despite the lack of any serious trouble on the the event, that amount just kept going up and up year upon year. Then in 2009, we had gone through the licensing process. We had got our license granted us by Mendip Council. Then for some reason in the last couple of weeks before the event was actually due to take place the police started upping the pressure and producing all sorts of new hoops for us to jump through. They were contacting our contractors and saying, are you getting your paid in advance for this event? You need to make sure you're being paid in advance. And they put a big squeeze on us because uh, actually people who were booking tickets were doing it online. And the online deal is that the the credit card companies don't actually cough up the money when people book. They don't cough up the money until the day that the event opens. And so we had a cash flow problem with that. And then on the weekend before the event was due to open, it should have opened on the, the Wednesday, on the, the previous Friday night, the police had put pressure on to the local authority Mendip Council officers, not the members who'd granted the uh, the license, but the the officers in the office to go along with the police's plan, which was to take out a high court injunction to remove our license. They served that on us late on the Friday evening, and. Um, To defend it, we would have had to have been in court first thing on the Monday morning. Fortunately, we were able to get legal advice over the the weekend, but it couldn't have been better calculated to try and prevent us doing so. And the reasons that they gave for wanting to take our licence away were basically trumped up they alleged uh, a lot of things that weren't true like we didn't have a proper security company which we did that we didn't have a proper agreement with the ambulance service which we did the one that we didn't think we could get around was a very minor one which was that um, we hadn't got the road closure order on the roads around the site finalized and that hadn't been rubber-stamped by the the man in the highways department of the county council who was supposed to do it because he'd been under pressure from the county solicitor not to do it. Although it turned out after the event that um, the notices which would have brought it into effect had actually been put up all around the site and then taken down on the Friday afternoon. So we didn't defend the High Court injunction because actually with all the the uncertainty that that aroused over the weekend, it meant that we couldn't get all our stewards on site and trained in time to properly steward the event the following week. And that would have meant that we 
would have been in breach of the licensing conditions anyway, even if we'd have gone to the High Court and got the the event license restored. Now, look, I hate to say it, but look, the Universal Convention of Human Rights, Freedom of Assembly, surely you shouldn't need to have the permission of the police in order to assemble. Well, we didn't used to. When we started the Big Green Gathering, we didn't need to because we found a a wrinkle within the um, the act that covered events at that time, which was that, uh, and it was a music license that you had to have in those days for, for an event with music, you didn't need a music license if the music was incidental to exhibitions and displays. And with the Big Green Gathering, we were able to say, because all the stages were powered by wind and solar power and pedal power that they were actually exhibitions of what you could do with renewable energy and the music was incidental to them that actually held water in law and meant that until the early 2000s we were able to carry on the event without uh, having to go through a licensing procedure the first big green gathering was about 1,500 people. Um, by 2000, we were up to 10, 11,000. By the end, by 2007, we were up to 20,000. But the licensing law changed. The old Miscellaneous Provisions Act that the previous licensing came under went out and a new licensing act came in, which also tightened up licensing for music in pubs and all sorts of things there were a lot of controversy about it because it meant that uh, pubs and so on had to go through a huge new licensing process just to have a couple of people playing a guitar in a corner but for the big green gathering it meant we had to go through a licensing process where we got a, a license off the local council but the police as well as the ambulance service and the fire service and so on were statutory consultees in the the licensing process and that actually meant that whatever the police said got incorporated in licensing conditions so they could dictate the the conditions under which a license would be granted but we managed to keep to those conditions we were never prosecuted for any breach of conditions well, it does effectively mean that if they want to local police can just put impossible conditions to stop a festival isn't it well that's what they tried over a number of years to do with the the big green gathering and in the end when they found they couldn't do that they did this maneuver of a high court injunction to take away the license four or five days before the event was due to start had we gone to the high court to contest that then we wouldn't have been on site making the preparations for the the event which would have enabled it to actually proceed in an orderly manner that fulfilled the licensing conditions so we were in a, a cleft stick if you like we were done one way or the other either we gave up our license and gave up the event or we went ahead with it if the high court allowed it but still couldn't keep to the licensing conditions and got done for breach of conditions. So actually the the event in 2009 didn't go ahead. The company had spent all its money on prepaying for the, the fencing and the trackway and the toilets and everything else, including the policing. And the people who'd paid for their tickets didn't get the event that they paid for. It was only afterwards that we found out that one of the uh, key people, the transport manager for the main bar on site, was actually an undercover policeman called Mark Kennedy, going under the name of Mark Stone. And it was a few months after the Big Green Gathering had been closed down that he was unmasked as a, an undercover policeman who'd been reporting to the Association of Chief Police Officers I have no doubt that the Chief Constable of Avon and Somerset at the time was getting information from the Association of Chief Police Officers. 
and it was certainly the the chief constable of Avon and Somerset who was behind the the operation that closed down the the big green gathering. Now, at the time, what Mark Kennedy would have known from his position in the the bar was that that bar was making at least ten thousand pounds a year out of the the big green gathering turnover in order to fund actions against climate change. So, as I say, we tried to get uh, accreditation with the, the Pitchford Inquiry to pursue that point and try and find out exactly what was being passed on to Avon and Somerset Police and what that had to do with the closing down of the, the Big Green Gathering. But so far, we haven't got the accreditation that enables us to do that. Well, I suppose that's the establishment not wanting to find itself guilty. You may well say that. I really couldn't comment. The Green Gatherings started up again over in Chepstow. How did that happen, and has it been reasonably successful? That happened because I, mean, I retired after 2009, um, but others who were involved in the the Big Green Gathering set up a a new company and started producing the Green Gathering and found a site in Chepstow, Chepstow Racecourse, where they hadn't had events before. They wanted to have events. They wanted to find a, a new form of income for their site there. Um, and it happened that uh, Chepstow Racecourse was already in possession of a license for events. So they became the licensee rather than the the event. So that made it a different kind of situation in regard to the the license. And it was also a very different kind of situation with the local authority because whereas Mendip Council had already got Glastonbury Festival and used to being vigorous with... Uh, its licensing of events and used to having an event that was big enough that it could actually meet any demands that were placed upon it and the police likewise were used to having an event there that could stump up vast amounts of money for policing vast amounts of money for security and so on in Chepstow it was an area that was starved of events and was really keen to have an event there so they've had a much easier time with the licensing there I and mean, it was after the big green gathering collapsed it was knocked back and it was small again like the big green gathering had been that started off with 1500 people the first year um, I think the the new green gatherings at Chepstow started off at about that size but have built themselves back up to six or seven thousand now and are going well. I go along every year as a participant, but no longer as an organiser. I'm happy to be retired. Do you think the days of the Free Festival are over then in Britain? The days of the Free Festival have been over since 1985. And actually, I think Stonehenge Festival, as it happened, and the amount of out of orderness, if you like, that happened there, at a time when the country was fairly out of order because there were riots going on in the inner cities and there was the miners' strike, there was a, there was a lot of disorder in the, the country as a whole. That showed that actually you can't have a big event without having some kind of security, some kind of order and sensible health and safety rules and enough toilets and enough planning and so on you can't just say we'll all meet up at such and such a place and bring what you expect to find and we'll have a festival because that was the way that Stonehenge and the free festivals were set up in the 70s and 80s and it worked okay up to a certain size you could do it with an event up to five or six thousand people so long as you had people who all went with a, a goodwill and with that intention that the, the free festival is one where you bring what you expect to find and you make it good by what you bring and what you put in. And you could have that sort of free will gathering up to that kind of size. But if you get 
much beyond that, then really it does need a bit of organisation and a bit of um, order. But it can be done in a way that retains the cooperative spirit and a, a feeling that everybody owns their share of it and it's what you bring to the festival that makes the festival. I think that's how the big green gathering worked, how the green gatherings continue to work and it shows that there is hope for self-organised human beings of goodwill. What do you make of the modern day? Because they've, uh, Her- English Heritage have allowed a you know sort of some sort of event at Stonehenge in the summer solstice now. Well, that again, we were involved in that because the English Heritage actually called in the organisers of the Big Green Gathering as consultants when they were talking about opening it up at midsummer again for the first time. That was part of this process of normalisation that we went through involving Fred Pritchard and Wiltshire Police and the Big Green Gatherings when it was in Wiltshire. We actually supplied English Heritage with stewards the first time that they opened it up again on, on Midsummer. I'm dismayed at the moment about the fact that they've gone back on saying that it would be open for free at Midsummer and now they're charging £15 parking for anyone who goes along at Midsummer. I think that's a, a retrograde step and given the amount of money that English Heritage makes all through the year out of Stonehenge it's unnecessary and a backward step but it's good that it is open on the on the solstices and the, the equinoxes for people to actually go there and, and use it as a temple people who feel so inclined but I don't think we'll ever go back to the kind of disorganised free for all Stonehenge free festival that we had in the the 70s and the early 80s. One uh, quite interesting spin-off, I was watching a programme, oh gosh, uh, maybe last year sometime, uh, one of the people involved in the convoy, the peace convoy, was uh, this guy Dale Vince, who's now started up uh, a eco-power company in Stroud. He's also running Forest Green Rovers, a football team up there. It's almost like you've got is it is it the yuppies uh, the idea of the or the yippies that that some hippies can become very commercially successful? Yes, I know Dale, and he wasn't only uh, at free festivals and on the convoy. He was also part of our uh, crew in the the Molesworth Rainbow Village in that winter, and he was with us when we got evicted by Michael Hesseltine. And he's done very well setting up uh, ecotricity, and I take my hat off to him. You know, and I can remember in the, the late 80s, he'd turn up at Glastonbury Festival with a, a fire engine with solar panels on the, the roof and a uh, wind turbine off the, the corner and uh, set up charging people's phones for them at, in the green fields at Glastonbury Festival. In a way, it's uh, the same as I went from being a person involved in free festivals and that, taking that kind of anarchistic approach to running a, a festival organising company that got its licence and dealt with the police and dealt with the authorities and, and did everything by the book. He's done the same in power generation and gone from being a, a hippie generating power on the the side of his truck and just powering people's mobile phones for a, a quid a charge up to actually running a company that served a major electricity supplier and uh, part of the renewable energy revolution on a, a national scale. I've heard him say, and I would say myself, you know, we've come through life from small beginnings and being kind of on the outside of society doing things that were so far out of the mainstream that you had to be a dropout to be doing them to a point where many people like us have said no we actually have to take this into the mainstream of society we have to make it available to people throughout society it's not a sellout to actually 
be properly organised and to work through company structures. And I take my hat off to Dale Vince. Are there any other spin-offs that you can think of from people who've gone on to do interesting things? Who were because it was a, I think, a, a creative crucible, really. There are, and I, I keep uh, running into them every now and then. People who were around in the the old days, and you're right to say it, it was a, a creative crucible, and and it's produced lots of people in the in the arts who see from year to year at uh, Glastonbury at other festivals in events like the uh, the London Olympics opening ceremony there were lots of people who'd come out of festival culture who were part of that entertainment that went on there um, there's lots of ways that uh, these things have come back into the mainstream in an age which is more ready to accept them into the the mainstream now and to understand what people were on about when they were just viewed as weirdos on the edge. How about uh, drugs, though? Because this is one of the fingers that uh, Hesseltine was wagging at the convoy, wagging at the free festival scene, that this is just a hotbed of drug dealers and... I mean, surely that must have been a problem. It's a problem of prohibition. It's the same as the problem that they had in America when they tried to prohibit alcohol. When you prohibit something, make it illegal, then it becomes something which is used by gangsters to make money. The people who were involved in the, the early free festivals, they were potheads and probably a lot more calm and, and laid back and unlikely to get into fights than the the average alcoholic drinking person down a pub. But when the the gangsters started bringing in the the hard drugs, when the, the heroin and, and cocaine and so on came along, that was actually very vigorously opposed by most of the people on the ground at the free festivals. A mate of mine, Sid Rawl, who was a very prominent and viewed by the authorities as, as a kind of organiser of Stonehenge, he was not afraid to put himself forward as a kind of figurehead, was actually threatened at Stonehenge in 83, I think it was, by... Uh, heroin dealers and uh, had guns pointed at him and, and fired at him and, and actually ended up under police protection towards the, the end of it because of the the stance that most people at the, the festival took vehemently against having uh, any hard drugs on site. And that is a problem. And as I say, it's what comes with creating an illegal situation like you had with uh, the prohibition of alcohol in America in the, the 1920s, which plays into the hands of gangster culture. And it is a tragedy of the second half of the 20th century, really, that throughout the West we had this so-called war on drugs, which was never going to be won and because it failed to take a a sympathetic attitude to a bunch of potheads in the 1960s, then helped create a drugs and gangsterism problem that is still with us today and caused all sorts of problems in uh, producer countries from uh, South America to Southeast Asia organized youth and a lot of youngsters now seem to want to get i mean you could almost talk, talk about them as the corbynistas some of them these young people who have joined the labor party what, what message have you got for them uh, lessons from your time in the 70s and 80s as an organized uh, like literally physical opposition to 
an authoritarian government because that's where we seem to be again now with the Conservatives. The first thing I'd like to make clear is that you're talking to uh, someone who's been a committed member of the Green Party ever since 1979. So uh, one of the first things that I'd say is you can't necessarily trust the the Labour Party and, and Corbyn himself isn't necessarily in charge of it and won't be there forever. Um, but certainly back in the day, back in the 70s, back in the, the 80s, we had a lot more freedom to do things. We were a lot. Fr it was a lot freer to organise. We had lots more civil liberties. We could do things without having to be licensed. We could do th things that, you know, from squatting empty houses to squatting fields and having festivals and having demonstrations and uh, sit-ins and... Because there's a lot uh, of talk today about the sort of dark days of the 1970s. Well, at least in those days, we did have a lot more traditional civil liberties, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, and the laws applying to those things have been progressively tightened and tightened and tightened over the the years of my lifetime. I mean, squatting, for example, after the, the Second World War, when there were millions of people in this country without houses, there was a huge squatting movement that went on in disused army bases, in Nissen huts all over the country. There were families squatting in MOD property. So that there was use of these freedoms that we had then in ways that simply aren't allowed now and the, the laws have been more and more tightened over the the years but there's always hope and there's always ingenuity and people find new ways of protesting new ways of doing things and there's actually an awful lot more communication now with the the internet and the world wide web and social networks and so on than was ever possible in I say my day I'm still around I've not gone away yet but uh in earlier times, shall we say. I say, just go to it. If you know you're right, then go ahead. I mean, I suppose one of the things you can do on the internet is make contact with people on a similar wavelength almost anywhere in the world. You can, and... Uh, of course, you have to be aware that whatever contact you do make is being monitored by the security services who've got computers that will look for code words, keywords, and uh, so on. So we're, we're under greater surveillance than ever before, but we've got as great a capacity as ever stand up for what we think is right and uh, make a difference to the world. Do you think there's a, a bit too much paranoia about the internet? You, you're talking about surveillance there, and that's one of the things I picked up from partly to do with the peace convoy. This was at the same time that Duncan Campbell in the 1980s was revealing Men With Hill as a spy base, spying on all the phone calls and this sort of thing with lines, digital lines, straight into the British phone network that the National Security Agency was using to spy on us. How do you, do you get that balance between being free and organising and actually making sure that what you're, you know, you're not getting too worried about being watched at the same time? Well, the first thing is keep it peaceful and don't do anything that uh, would actually add up to terrorism and putting people's lives in danger and, and so on. You know, stay on the, on the right side of that. And if you do that, there's an old Doors song that... Uh, says, they got the guns, but we got the numbers. Going to win, yeah, we're taking over. There'll always be an advantage in terms of numbers. They can't be listening to everybody's phone calls all the time. They can't be, even with the, the computers, they can't be spying on everyone's emails all the time. If we got the numbers, it's a matter of, enough people getting involved then 
a difference can be made. And anyway, it's it's a matter of numbers because every government, as they said in the American Declaration of Independence, governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed. If enough people get together and say, no, you haven't got our consent for this, then in a democracy, it can't happen but it's a matter of getting enough people together and motivating enough people and actually with the internet communications that we have nowadays we can motivate and mobilise people on scales that have never been seen before and Do you think for some people they just want to stay completely off the internet um, disconnected from it totally so is there a case for that as well? There is, and I don't do social networks. I don't do Facebook or, or Twitter. You can get into a position where you spend all your time just looking at a screen, and I like to have a, a life in the real world as well. I'd, I'd rather spend my time digging my allotment than uh, sitting over a computer all the time. But you know, it has its uses as well. It's, it's a matter of maintaining the balance and keeping your feet on the ground and your wellies in the mud at the same time as being able to cope with the, the technology and the benefits that that brings. And you're a Green Party activist, but a lot of people would just point at the Green Party and say, well, there's nowhere there anywhere near power. It's the Labour Party you've got to join if you really wanted to stand a chance of uh, changing things, like, for example, the Labour Party did in 1945 with you know the big nationalisation, the introduction of the health service, that kind of thing. Well, the Labour Party did very well in 1945, and then it brought in uh, Britain's first nuclear weapons program. Um, and then a lot of people would say it continued to sell out in the the 60s and 70s under Wilson and then Callaghan, and then in the the 90s and 2000s under Blair. I like to be on the the side that's got it right and whether that actually brings us to power ourselves or just pushes our ideas up to the uh, the top of the uh, political agenda I don't really mind at the end of the day I'm glad to see Corbyn's Labour Party having adopted half of the Green Party's manifesto from the 2015 general election. I wish they'd adopt the other half as well, but I think we're making progress one way or another. But I think actually the two-party system leads to corruption and leads to sellouts, and the, the lack of proportional representation in this country means that you get two big parties that get a disproportionate share of the seats in Parliament and have to pander to middle ground floating voters to tip the balance one way or another and other people elsewhere on the spectrum are, are never properly represented and history shows that you need other voices in there in order to keep people held to account and on the, the straight and narrow and on the right track. So that's why I'm part of the Green Party and will continue to be part of the Green Party and I think that they're absolutely essential to keep guiding our political system towards the sustainable future that we all need.